in the press in. Come on. It's not about how you feel. Come on. Sometimes we don't feel like it. Amen. That's why it's called the sacrifice of praise from the fruit of our lips. Come on. Just begin to bless him. Come on. Just take a few seconds to come on. Begin to magnify him and exalt him. Lord, we worship you. We bless you, Lord. Flow to you, flow to you, flow to you. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, that all my worship. Let all my praise. Flow to you. Flow to you. Come on. Come on. Let all my worship flow. Let all my praise flow to you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Come on, let all my worship. Let all my worship. Come on. Amen. Since you're already standing, why don't you grab your word? Why don't you grab your word? But before we go into the word, why don't you just look at somebody and tell them I'm glad to see you here this morning. Amen. Glad to see you this morning. Amen. Amen. And sometimes we can tell that our praise and our worship is predicated upon who sees it. If, if, if we don't have a lot of people that Sunday, we praise and worship like it's not a lot of people. Amen. But I don't come here for anybody other than God. Amen. I know who the rock of my salvation is, and I know who brought me. Come on, somebody. Amen. Thus far. Once you got your word, why don't you go to your weapon, whatever it is you use to delve into the word of God, whether it be your tablet, your cellular device, whatever it is that you use to go to the word of God, why don't you grab it, pull it close to you, for it is your weapon. Amen. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, that's the last gospel. I said not the last book in your Bible, but the last gospel. Amen. Um, go to Luke. And we'll get there. I want you to say amen. And we're looking at Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to read quite, uh, quite a bit more than usual. But it, I promise you it's going to bless you. Luke chapter 1. And we'll begin reading at uh, verse 5, when you there say amen. amen. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous. I said they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office, as Zechariah executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Somebody say fear. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at this birth. Now I want to go fast forward and skip over to, uh, let's move down to uh, verse 19. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their, se in their season. Now go down to verse 25. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me, this is a little bit, in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. 
And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, I want to skip down. I know I'm skipping over some stuff, but I'm going to work with it. Just, just I'm doing this for the sake of reading. Uh, and let's look at verse 40. And it says, and entered into the house of Zechariah and saluted Elizabeth. This is Mary walking into the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, when Mary spoke to her, that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. You may be seeing the presence of the Lord. I want to talk about the treasure in hidden places. Amen. I want to deal with the treasure in hidden places. Amen. Why don't you look at your neighbor and tell them, amen, there's a treasure within you. Oh, come on. There's a treasure within you. You can do better than that. You don't know what your neighbor is going through. You need to let them know that there's a treasure within you. Now, I came to tell you, I didn't come to speak to you today as some religious person. I came to really, you know, there are times where sermons are appropriate, but there are other times that we've got to be able to uh, be sensitive to the Spirit of God and to deliver unto you a message. And today, I believe it's one of those days I didn't come to speak to you a sermon. I'm not very calculated, not very polished, uh, not very poised, if you will. I don't have a bunch of notes to share with you, but what I do have is a message message to share with you and I came to speak to some people to let them know that there is something inside of you uh, perhaps today you're in here and it seems like everything is coming up against you all at once you, you're finding yourself in that place where you're beginning to say you're beginning to rehearse in your own thinking you're beginning to say things like if it's not one thing it's another it seems like if it's not the sink that's broke then it's the bath. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it just seems like everything is falling apart in your life. And what I've come to talk to you about is because what you've got to understand is the devil is never after you. There is not one scriptural evidence that tells us that the devil is after you. Look at your name and say, the devil ain't after you. But what I can tell you is there are numerous times that I, when I gravitate into the word of God and I begin to delve within it, what I begin to discover is that what the enemy does go after is he will go after your promise. But what the devil knows is he can never put his hand on your promise. So what he does is he begins to destroy you. He begins to mess up your mental faculties. He begins to mess with your money. He begins to mess with the things that will distract you. Come on, but I dare you to declare with me today that devil, get behind me. I'm not going to fall for the distractions. Now, for everybody in this room, for everybody in this room that thinks that uh, you're the only person that has a struggle, really, if we went around the room this morning and everybody began to tell their story, you would find out that surely there's somebody in this room that has gone through far worse than you and has survived great calamity, great chaos, and great trial, and great tribulation. The reality is that everybody in this room has gone through something. And the reality is none of us have gone through the same thing for the most part. And we're certainly not going through it the same way. But what we have to understand, we have to be appreciative of the person sitting to the, to the left or the right of us. Because what we have to understand is that God gives us a grace to go through what we go through. And a lot of times what we go through is based upon not what is on the outside of us, but it is based upon what is on the inside of us. The Bible says in Romans, it says that God gives us a grace according to our gift. In other words, God assigns certain things to our life to challenge us to get into the next place so that we can birth out the gift, the calling, the purpose that's on the inside. Y'all better wake up this morning because I'm going to preach in a little bit. And if you don't wake up now, you're going to miss it in a few minutes because I came to charge your faith. I came to charge your faith. I didn't come to preach, preach to your head because that's your problem. You come to church for information. I'm not coming to deposit to you information. I'm about to bring you into another experience if you would just get with the word of the Lord today. Come on, is there anybody that say, I need a word? Uh, so here, here in Luke chapter 1, I'm going to preach. It's not going to take me long. I promise you, we're going to get out. You're going to be able to eat brunch, amen, when I get through. It's not going to take me long. But here we are in Luke chapter 1, and I, I know that when we begin to talk about the first chapter of uh, any of the gospels, 
Gospels, when we begin to talk about the first chapter, we automatically begin to gravitate there. We say, oh, well, this is the beginning of, of the gospel, so we know that it automatically is going to talk about the birth of Jesus. But Luke is interesting because Luke begins to talk about the birth of John. It begins to talk about the things surrounding John. And, and, and I told you that I want to talk about uh, the treasure in the hidden place, treasure in the hidden place. Uh, and so uh, it starts out by telling us about two people, it begins to tell us about, uh, he, uh, it begins to tell us about Zacharias, who is a priest, and his wife, Elizabeth, and they're both old. They're both old. They're both old. But it's amazing because their names don't just mean anything. Their names uh, have this tone of promise uh, because Zechariah's name means remembered of God. And uh, and then Elizabeth's name means the oath of God, which means the word of God, the vow of God. Now, it's amazing that two people whose name breathe out promise was in a situation where they did not see a promise. Uh, now, I know that the first thing that the devil will try to tell you, I'm going to preach in a little bit. Uh, the first thing that the devil will tell you is when things don't go right in your life, the devil will begin to tell you that's because you're not doing something right. Uh, and, and that is sometimes true, but I found more often than not that the reason why things begin to fall apart in our lives is not necessarily because we are doing everything wrong, but it is sometimes when we begin to do things right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's amazing how you don't realize how you spend your money until the moment you begin to start tithing. Oh, I can't get no help up in here because I know the devil messes with your mind. Uh, it's amazing how we will not, uh, it seems like our money will do fine until we begin to give a faith seed and then seem like, well, if I wouldn't have gave that, then uh, then maybe the devil would. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It seems like nothing was going wrong in your life until you came up to the altar talking about, I'm going to serve the Lord. Now everything is going crazy in your life. I guess I'm not talking to anybody, but that's all right. If I, if I keep preaching long enough, I'll preach to myself and I'll at least get excited. But now you have two people that are faithful. They're committed to the things of God. The Bible says that they are righteous, which means they uphold the standard of the Lord. They uphold the standard of the Lord. And so you have these two people. The Bible says that Zacharias is a faithful priest. The Bible says he's there in his lot, his lot, what he does, because what you got to understand, the priests, they all had a different thing. One of them began to sing. One of them was a minstrel. He would worship the Lord in the temple. And then there was another one that would come in and offer the sacrifice. And what Zacharias, uh, what his responsibility was, was that he would burn the incense. Now, I'm teaching, but y'all just stick with me. It's going to get good in a second. Uh, he, he's burning the incense. That's his responsibility. And the Bible says, while he's doing that, now, well, mind you, there was nothing significant about smoke coming up, because if you're burning incense, wouldn't we expect smoke? But the Bible says there was a great smoke that rose up. See, uh, sometimes you got to understand when God tries to get your attention, he'll take the thing that you've been doing, and he'll just blow it up to get your attention. So that's why when you become to when you get to the place where you depend on money and you serve money, now God will affect your money. He will begin to shake your money to make you begin to pray. That was for somebody. Uh, that, that's why, amen, if you depend on your spouse for every anything, then all of a sudden your spouse start acting crazy because God wants to shake whatever you're accustomed to to show you that he's about to do something in you that you're not accustomed to. Well, I can't get no help up in here today. Um, so now, Zacharias is doing what he's supposed to be doing. You got to get this. He is doing what he's supposed to be doing. Now, mind you, I know this is kind of convicted because we got some people in the room today that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So you're going to have to tune out on this situation right here because I'm not speaking to you right here. I'm, I'm not no prophet liar. Amen. So I'm not going to be prophesying to you, telling you you're about to be blessed and overflowing and you ain't doing what you're supposed to be. But the Bible says Zacharias is doing what he's supposed to be doing. And while he's there, the Bible says the angel of the Lord comes in. It says the angel of the Lord appears in the smoke. It appears in the right on the right hand. It could have appeared on the left side, but it was important that it appeared on the right hand because the right hand was always the hand of blessing. The right hand was also the, always the hand of approval. And so the angel comes up in the place of approval and tells Zechariah, you have been approved. The thing that you have been praying for, because watch this, the Bible says as soon as the angel of the Lord appears, something interesting happens. The scripture says that Zechariah gets fearful. He gets scared. Can I tell you, now, now, now I'm about to start preaching here in a little bit, but the first thing that you have to understand is that fear is opposition of faith. You never can operate in faith and fear at the same time. That's why the scripture said that faith without works is dead because fear will tell you it don't take all that. Don't work it. You know, just come to church. For all you people that think that you're doing something for God just by attending church, shame on you because can I tell you some church attendance 
has sent more people to hell than is sent to heaven. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I just lost some religious people. You say, what are you saying? Because a lot of times people think they can live any kind of way as long as they take care of this. You ever seen somebody that they ate anything they wanted to because they went to the gym? And we have become, we have become, come such as those because in the church we begin, we deem it if we come to a prayer meeting, if we read the Bible every day, if we come to church and we can live any kind of way, but it doesn't work like that. And the Bible says, I, I can't get no amens right there, but the, uh, sometimes it's good that we're quiet. That means you're listening. Uh, so watch this. The Bible says that the angel appears unto Zechariah and says, you've been doing good. He said, now, I'm gonna, the Lord is going to grant you your petition. Now watch this. And the Bible says Zechariah gets fearful. He gets fearful. Can I tell you something? God has never challenged you to go to another level of faith. He has never challenged you to go to another level of prayer if the thing that God speaks to your heart doesn't scare you. Because for all you people that have in the back of your mind that you're going to be great in the kingdom of God, if it don't scare you, if as soon as it hits your spirit, you take off running with it, that wasn't God. Because if God ever comes to challenge you in the place of your normalcy, it's going to scare you half to death. You start questioning, you start saying stuff like, how, Lord, will I accomplish it? And how, Lord, will I do it? And, Lord, I can't see how this is going to happen. You begin to start saying, well, my money don't look like right. And, 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 and my faith, you know, my, I don't know if my faith is where it needs to be. And, and I don't know if I'm really the best preacher. And I don't know if I'm the best singer. Because if God ever tells you to do something or God ever speaks to you, God ever challenges you, it will scare the life out of you. And so a lot of times in church, people get mad when the, I'm just teaching today. I'm just talking a little bit. Uh, we, a lot of times we get mad at the preacher and we leave our church and say, he sure made me mad. He's preaching all my business. Well, the reality is sometimes you need to take that offense and take it for what it is. It is not offense. It is conviction. It is actually the word sharing with you that you need to make some changes. Do I have anybody in here that's motivated by some of the life circumstances to make some changes? I mean, can you at least say amen to that? All right, all right, I'm going on a little bit further because I'm going to preach in a little bit. Y'all just always want people to stand on their head and hoop and holler. No, we don't need to do that. That's why you haven't grown yet. That's all you want to do. Now watch this. Elizabeth, the Bible says that God, the angel speaks to Zechariah, and he says, uh, the, thing that I, the thing that you've been praying for is about to happen for you. And watch what he says. We didn't read it. But the Bible says that Zechariah says this. Zechariah returns to the angel and he says to him, he says, well, I don't know because I'm too old. Mm. Okay. Y'all stick. Y'all going to wake up, right? Y'all should drink some coffee this morning. Shame on you. Watch this. In other words, what happens when God starts moving outside of your time frame. That's basically what Zechariah said. Zechariah said, yeah, I asked you for that. But can I paraphrase it? But I asked you for that when I could do it. But now, God, you're telling me you're going to do it but you're going to do it when I can't help you with it. I'm preaching in here. In other words, some of us, we have not waited long enough on the thing we believe God to do. Because for a lot of us, we will believe God for a thing as long as we can see us doing it. But that's not how it works. Because if that was how it worked, then Sister Karen, you wouldn't have to pray for it. Because you could have done it from the beginning. So we pray for what we cannot do, trusting that he will do it how he wants to do it. But now what well, we got to understand, but we say that with our lips. But the reality is in our heart, we have purpose a time. But we've got to understand that God is not a man, uh-huh, that he should lie, no son of man, that he should repent. And what we have to understand, he is not a man, which means, which suggests to us, what we have to understand is that God is a spirit. 
So God does not operate in time. Because he's an eternal being. Y'all want to help me in here. That's why you don't operate in eternity until you die. Because then you're strictly spirit. But as long as you have the inhibited part of you called the flesh, you will have to operate under the circumstances of the time. So oh, y'all don't want to help me in here. That's why as long as you live, you will get old. Y'all don't want to help me in here. Because you're under the laws of this system. You know, gravity makes things sag. Y'all know what, what goes up must come because you have to operate under the laws of this system. Y'all, now you're getting it. And, and what, what happens is we begin to operate with God. We begin to pray to God. And I, really, we don't pray. We begin to dictate to God. We begin to act like a pimp. And he's our prostitute. And we're going to tell him what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. But that is not how it works with God because God is eternal. So God does not have to operate under the laws of this system. That's why when God blesses you, every Everybody around you will be trying to figure out how he did it because, and he will just kind of turn back to you and look at you and say, because when I do it, I do it the way I want to do it, how I want to do it, when I want to do it, because I'm bigger than your system. Y'all don't want to help me in here. And God looks at the earth realm and say, yeah, I shocked you, didn't you? I shocked you because my economy ain't of this economy. Y'all don't want to help me in here. My favor don't come from this system. My blessing don't come from this. Oh, y'all don't want to help me in here. The doors I open don't come from this system. I know your boss couldn't do it. Corporate couldn't do it. But I'll just make a way. Come on, the Bible says in Isaiah, he will make a highway in a desert. Y'all don't want to help me in here. In other words, when God does it, he does it. Y'all quiet. Stephanie's trying to preach for me, and y'all ain't saying nothing. Lord have mercy. Watch this. So, Zechariah hears the angel of the Lord saying he's going to do it. But it don't look like he's going to do it. Now, watch this. I, this part spoke to me because this reveals to me how much God cares for me. Watch this. The scripture says that after Zechariah says, I'm too old, I can't do that. The Bible says the angel said, all right, I see where you're going with this. And the Bible says he made Zechariah dumb for a season. In other words, he couldn't speak. Uh, somebody didn't get there. See, whenever there's a great promise presented to you in your life, you got to learn when it's appropriate to talk and when it's not. Because if you ever get to running your mouth, what you got to understand about your mind is your mind does not know how to filter out anything because the mind receives everything as information. So if you keep talking, you will be feeding your mind stuff that will be in opposition to your faith. And what will happen is Zechariah could have talked himself right out of the promise that he had been anticipating for a long time. Look at your neighbor and say, just shut up. Now, they might get offended. Now, if they get offended, just point at them. We're going to know they're the devil. All right. Now, you've got, to, you've got to learn how to shut up because a lot of times our, our problem is that we talk too much. You know what I'm saying. We start going through stuff, and so we start talking what we go through. We, we stop speaking faith. You know, it's amazing how you can be believing God as long as it looks like you're approaching the thing. And then when you, get, uh, when you get to a stop sign in life, then you begin to start saying, well, I don't know. Well, see, that's the time that you need to get a dumb spirit. You need to learn how to shut up and say, wait a minute. Mm-mm. But I ain't going to talk against it because I'm not going to hinder myself from producing this hidden treasure on the inside of me. Now, the Bible says, I'm fast forwarding because I got to, there's a part I really want to deal with today. Uh, the scripture says, I'm just teaching because, can I, can I just tell you something? I want to talk to you today like I'm your coach. Like I'm sponsoring you into your next level. I didn't come here, I didn't come here with the purpose of preaching today. There's times when that's appropriate. But I came to coach you into your next level. Because you've got a spirit of apathy. That whatever happens just happens. But the reality is that is not what you're supposed to do. The Bible says that we are, we are kingdom builders. Watch this. So if I'm a kingdom builder, well, the kingdom don't just happen to build itself. I've got to put myself, put my hand to the plow. And the Bible says that any man that puts his hand to the plow, he said if he looks back, he's not worthy. Oh, y'all don't want to help me in here. See, the fact of the matter is you're only, your promise, amen, you're only worth uh, achieving your promise if you will be willing to commit to the process and not go back. 
Now, I wonder how many people I'm talking to that you believe for a season. Believe for a season, then you stop. Believe for a season, then you stop. Can I tell you something? The only thing that's separating you from your promise, it is not God and it's not the devil. What is separating you from you and your promise is you. Because you want to talk against it. You want to lose the faith for it. That's why I came to speak to you to ignite something on the inside of you to turn on a holy passion and begin to get to work. There are people in this room, you got books on the inside of you. People in this room, you got business on the inside of you. People on, on, in this room, that you've got ministry on the inside of you. And the only thing that's hindering you from it is not God and it's not the devil. It is you. It is your apathetic view. You've got to turn off the pathetic view and move into the prophetic view. You've got to begin to see things to coming into your life before it comes. And watch this. I tell you what, if you ever walk into something, I know this has been a big trend in the church nowadays where people begin to say that uh, people walk around and say uh, it, it was a blessing and I didn't see it coming. Well, the reality is that happens a few times, but I believe that God is not calling us to the type of blessings that shock us. He's calling us to the type of blessing that we prepare for. The Bible says that when the woman saw the man of God, if you check in 1 Kings, the Bible says when she saw the man of God, she said, I perceive that thou art a man of God. The second time he, the, uh, he came a few times, she said, we're going to build him a room. In other in other words, she prepared for something. Now watch this. Her son died. She put her son in that very same room she had built for the man of God. But watch this. Because she had made room for it, when her son died, the man of God came and healed him and he sat up. What I am telling you is, if you want your dead thing to live, you got to start building a room for it. You got to start preparing for it. Don't tell me about how you're going to be a millionaire and you dodging the bill collector. You need to pay that man. Y'all want to help me in here. I'm talking to some people here and I'm telling you you need to prioritize and get things together in your life. I am not preaching to you some watered down silly gospel. I am preaching to you the truth, the emphatical truth of the word of God. It is time for you to wake up in your spirit. You've been quiet too long. You have took tucked your dreams to sleep. You have locked them to bed, but it is time to wake them up. Make that thing scream. Come on somebody, don't put a pacifier in his mouth, but begin to feed that thing. Oh, you can say something about that, huh? Watch this. Some, some of us still just looking. Watch this. The Bible says that he could not speak. So now watch this. The promise, the promise that Zechariah had, he couldn't produce it alone. If God tells a man he's going to have a baby, Y'all didn't sleep in biology, did you? He can't do that by himself. So Elizabeth had to be attached to the birthing process. But Zechariah's faith wasn't where it needed to be. He almost ruined it before it ever got to her. My God. See, what I want to tell somebody in this room is, a lot of you are ruining it before you can get it to the place where it can be cared for. Because before you can get it to, in the right hands, you've already ruined it in your hands. Watch this. The Bible says, see, I just told you, I'm not coming here to preach, so y'all, I'm sorry. I'm, we're not about to shout today. I'm trying to, I'm trying to let you grow up here. Watch this. So, Elizabeth, the Bible says the angel goes ahead of Zechariah and speaks to Elizabeth and says, now you're going to have a son, and the son's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost from day one, and she don't know how it's going to happen, and she's like, okay, now, but now watch this, there's a conflict though, because the Bible says that the angel tells her, he said, now your cousin Mary is pregnant too. She's pregnant with the Lord Jesus. Now, it was, you would think that's not significant, but it's very important. Because without that bit of information, Elizabeth could have gone with the mistaken, uh, mistaken idea that her child was the Messiah. Because every Jewish woman wanted to give birth to the Messiah. Uh, Y'all not getting this. Y'all not getting this. 
it's a dangerous place to have something on the inside of you and can't identify what it is. Y'all don't want to help me in here. I mean, come on, is there any women in here ever had a baby? It would be a disappointing thing that for nine months they told you you're going to have a girl. And when it come out the womb, it's a boy. It's a, it's a scary thing. Come on, somebody. For nine months, them to tell you you're having one baby. And when you get to the birthing place, you find out you haven't. I'll pass out. I'll pass out. Watch this. Because you got to prepare for what's coming. Oh, y'all don't help me here. And she would have been, watch this, she wouldn't have been able to put uh, things in place. Things wouldn't have been in perspective if she had perceived that what she was going to give birth to was going to save the world. She would have been preparing for a Messiah with a forerunner anointed. Y'all don't help me in here. And uh, you've got to identify what is in you. You've got to identify what God is taking you to. Watch this. If you can't sing, it's a bad place to prepare yourself. You can go to voice lessons all you want, but if you can't sing, you can't sing, and you're prepared for the wrong thing, and you're going to bring yourself to a shame and a frustration because you're preparing for the wrong thing. But I came to speak to some people this morning to tell you to get up and incubate the thing that's on the inside of you. It is time for you to begin to spend more time in prayer and recognize what is on the inside of you. What am I feeding? Why am I going through what I'm going through? Why is hell surrounding me? It must have something to do with what I have to produce. I must not be speaking to nobody that want nothing. Watch this. He has to go and talk to Elizabeth. Now watch this. After he talks to Elizabeth, she still didn't have what she needed. See, for all you people that a few years back you was bumping, all I need is King Jesus, you've been misinformed. The Bible says we are joined. Come on, you can read in your Bible. I'm not making this up. It said we're joined together by that which every joint supplied. In other words, I need your gift. But don't, don't get mad at me because you need, and I can't disregard you and abuse you because I need, but don't you trip because you need, I need your, but you need, and it's amazing to me the amount of people that would reject people based upon what they think they don't have. But can I tell you something? We all got something that we don't have. The thing we need to focus on is what you, oh, I can't get no help right there. And people will reject you and people will disregard you for what you don't have. But I dare somebody to get a little ghetto with the enemy this morning and say, you must not know about me because there's something that I got that you need to have. Well, I'm going to preach it a little bit. Uh, the Bible says that after the angel spoke to Elizabeth and said, this is what's on the inside of you, say so you're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost from day one. Elizabeth said, okay, all right, if you say so. I, I, I ain't going to argue. I see what happened to my husband. He got to talking, and now he can't talk at all. And the Bible says that uh, what get me, got me was she was old, and the Bible says that Elizabeth goes and hides for five days, five months. I got to deal with this. Five is a significant number. Five is a number of grace. Well, I can't get no help up in here. Uh, can I tell you something? I thank God for the allowances he gives you. Because if God ever gives you something to produce out of your life, God will allow you to undergo a grace period where he will hide you, where nobody will see you. Because the reality is, if we see you the minute that something has been conceived in you, we're going to see you in a bad place. Y'all don't want to help me in here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because it would have been a shameful thing in the natural. She's an old woman, and we got to see her pregnant. 
And but watch this. I begin to study when I begin to look at this. When God spoke to me, He said the reason why she went through the five months of grace was because not because He was hiding her from people. It was because God was showing her herself. See, you can't never fully deliver your baby. You can't fully nourish that baby if you don't know you. Y'all don't want to help me in here. Because you'll begin to go out with a wrong mentality. You begin to think that maybe you did it. Y'all don't want to help me in here. But I believe that the woman had to shut away. She had to pray. She had to say, Lord, how do I deal with something so great? Can I tell you something? You don't know that you have something great on the inside of you. If it does not make you uncomfortable, you do not know that you have something great on the inside of you. If you can rise rationalize how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen. But I'm telling you, when God has put something great in your spirit, you will be confused. You will be befuddled. You will have to strategize. You will have to write till your hands cramp. Can I tell you something? You will not get the amount of sleep you used to get. When you know that you've got something great in the inside of you, you will begin to go to sleep with it. You will wake up with it. You will go to sleep with it. You will wake up with it. You will feed it. Y'all want to help me in here. The Bible says that when God spoke to Elizabeth, and told her she was going to bear John the Bible says that he told her now I'm going to change your diet he said you will not drink any strong drink you will not eat any meat y'all don't help me in here because when you begin to have something on the inside of you that has such great promise and such great potential you got to change everything around you in order to burst that thing out people don't understand why you don't go the places you used to go and do the things you used to do but you got to tell I got something on the inside of me and you might mess it up because you can't understand that I've got something that I'm carrying. It's making me uncomfortable. It's making me feel crazy. It's making me look stupid. I feel a little strange because I felt like I was behind time. But I believe that God is doing something phenomenal in my life. I believe that God is producing something in my life. I'm not going through all this hell for nothing. I'm not going through all these struggles for nothing. I'm not being lied on for nothing. People are not moving out of my life for nothing. It's because I have something to produce well I feel like preaching the Bible says that after he speaks to Elizabeth the last thing he tells us he tells her he said now look your cousin Mary she got a baby and you think you got a promise but she got a greater one because the Messiah is on the inside of her now watch this we have two extremes so for all you people that's at one level, and I couldn't deal with you on that level, now I'm about to deal with you on this level. You got Elizabeth, who is too old. But you got Mary, who is too young. Uh, because Mary, not only is she a virgin, but she was about the age of 14 years old. That was acceptable back then. Don't you marry your child at 14 now. Watch this. She gets married. She's getting ready to get married. She's engaged. And, but she's never slept with the man. The Bible says she's a virgin. So now you have Elizabeth hiding it because she feels she's behind time. And you have another one hiding it because it appears they're ahead of time. Y'all ain't getting this. Watch this because what you got to understand is never base your promise on the timing of your neighbor because what for somebody they got to do later in life but for you you might have to do it early in life and don't ever let somebody talk you out of promise based on their own timeline you got to tell them when they say you're too young for that you got to tell them no you was too young for that but I, oh y'all don't want to help me in here people will hate on you and lie on you and try to discourage you but you got to tell them I'm not you oh y'all don't help me in here Elizabeth that works for you but Mary this works for you Mary says, uh, the Bible says the angel went to Mary. I ain't got time to deal with that. I'm preaching to somebody in here. Oh, come on, come on, I'm preaching to somebody. Somebody say, uh-uh, I think I get it now, Pastor. I, I know it's something in me. I, I can't let it go. I See, because watch this, some of us in this room right now, oh, I feel like prophesying to you. There's some people in this room right now, the reason why you've given up, because the last thing you tried didn't work. But I came to prophesy to you as a sure prophet of God and told you the last thing may have not worked, but this time. Oh, y'all don't want to help me in here this time. Uh, this time, because you went through some changes that has changed your nature and changed your mindset. And this time, oh, y'all don't want to help me in here. Why don't you high five your neighbor and tell them this time it's going to work. The Bible says that the angel goes to Mary, the one that was ahead of time, 
to go and confront the one that was behind time. I wish I had somebody here this morning. I said the one that was ahead of time had to go and talk to the one that was behind time. But when I said that, a scripture just jumped up in my spirit. It just, now I get the fullness of it. Paul was talking to his spiritual son, a young man. He said, let no man despise you because of your youth. In other words, there's some people that are behind time that need to see somebody that's ahead of time. Isn't it amazing that when people start grabbing stuff, you feel like you ought to have by now. It'll make you jump up and say, uh-uh, I should have that too. Because sometimes God puts people in our, in, in our, in our face to remind us of what we could become if we had ever dared to become in the past. But it reminds us it's still not too late. Watch this. Something interesting happens. The Bible says... Now, if this, I mean, now, for all you people that thought I was deep, now, this is going to be deep right here. This is going to be powerful right here. God, I feel something on this thing right here. The Bible says when Mary gets to Elizabeth, all she says is, the Bible says she salutes her. Now, you know how women are. That would be suggestive. We know that uh, Mary didn't just say, how you doing? When she came in, she embraced Elizabeth. And it says the minute she embraced the one that was behind time, the one that was ahead of time, when as soon as the one that was ahead of time embraced the one that was behind time, the one that was behind time promised jumped up, oh my God, on the inside of her. Can I tell you something? You're not great as long as you just connected to you. But you got to be connected to somebody that will make things on the inside of you leap. Some of you say, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Since I joined the church, my life has changed. Well, that's because somebody that's ahead of time got to speak to somebody that's behind time and tell them, get your mind out. Come on, get your spirit out because there's something on the inside of you that needs to leap up. Come on, somebody. Some of you didn't know you had a business on the inside of you until you hurt. Oh, y'all don't help me in here. You didn't know that a marriage could work. Come on, because you were stuck on what your mama did and what your daddy did, but you had to hear somebody that made it jump up. Watch this. One of the most powerful things the Lord ever spoke to me was, he said, it's only a fool that loves his own counsel. I had just started, started the church, and I had to say, I mean, it was a good intention, but I just went too far with it. I just started the church, and I had the same where I didn't want to hang out with a lot of pastors because when I came to the city, every pastor I had yoked up with was fake. So I didn't want to deal with preachers. And I said, well, you know, IRC, we're going to be IRC, and we're going to fool with all that junk. Now, and God spoke to me because there came a place in the ministry where I perceived. See, see, wisdom will make you perceive. When everybody else be, and people will come to the church, Pastor Harrison, and this is what they do. They come to church and say, you're doing a good job. But wisdom will say, I know what you said, but I see that there's something more in me. And I can't understand why I can't get what's in me to get outside of me. It's not manifesting. And I need some wisdom here. And watch this. And what God told me in prayer when I was in that mode, he said, what you got to understand is only a fool that is in love with his own counsel. So I went to seek out people that were doing ministry on the level I saw in myself. And people told me, said, well, you know, that pastor, that big church, they're not going to talk to you. And I began to, begin to talk to people that people would say, it ain't no way. And I said, well, it's way because it happened. Because you've got to have the ability to connect with somebody that may be behind time, but they still conceived. And you might be ahead of time. And the person behind, behind time, if he's got sense, she has sense, they never get mad at the person that's ahead of time. Because they recognize that the person that's ahead of time may have something greater. 
Because it's only greatness that will cause a person to be ahead of time and succeed. Because if you ever get ahead of time and it's not appointed by God, you'll fall face first. See, you look around the building, there ain't no old people in here. You are the people that are ahead of time. Which would say, suggest that you have tremendous promise within you. But don't ever take it for granted. Because to whom much is given, much is required. So you got to go and find people that you can make their promise leap. That's why it's important that we encourage one another because all we're doing is making one another's promise. And watch this. You think it was just about making her promise leap. I'm closing with this. The scripture says, not only did the baby leap, he said then Elizabeth was immediately filled with the Holy Ghost. Y'all know it though. I don't have time to talk about the Holy Ghost, but you know what the Holy Ghost is. The Holy Ghost empowers anything it comes in contact with. So it would have been one thing to make her promise leap, but if it hadn't changed her promise. But she gave her something that fed it. And what says, what you gotta understand in the natural sense is that anything that the mother eats, she shares with the babe. And if any habit that the mother part she partakes in, she shares with the baby. She drink alcohol, the baby drink alcohol. She smokes cigarette, the baby smokes cigarette. Because everything she does, she shares. So when she received empowerment, instantaneously, that was what caused the baby to leap. The baby said, I got what I need now. My God. See, watch this. When we come into people's presence who are who are trailblazers, something ought to click within us that say, now I got what I need. That's why I couldn't go to anybody's church. I got to go somewhere that when I come out, I say, I got to work. I got to get something done. See, some people are comfortable with going nowhere. That's a slave ship. I prefer a cruise. Cruise, we got destinations, but we all know we come back home. Slave ship, we don't know where we're going to be, and we're going to be sold off. And a lot of people, their church is set up as a slave ship. No destination. And when you get there, you're done. And we're going to beat the mess out of you. We're just going to work you to death. But promise does not work you to death. See, work, promise is something, I'm, I'm speaking to some people here today. Promise is something that keeps on giving. Because pro whenever you have a promise from God, it does not just change your life. It changes the lives of those that come in contact with you. You ever want to see if somebody's got a promise? You first, first stand up and look at their life. Say, has anything changed? And then the next thing you need to know is, what was sharpened by coming in contact with them? Everybody on your feet. I hope that in these, in my little Sunday school lesson this morning, I hope that I spoke to somebody's heart this morning, spoke to somebody's promise this morning. Lately, uh, Thursday night, I went and ministered in Alexandria, and the Lord had me do something, and I, and I feel that I want to do that. I believe that the Lord would have me to do that again today. But I want everybody that feels that they have a promise within them, I want you to make it to the altar. Now, what I'm saying is it's not just crazy. I'm not giving you something that's not scriptural. The Bible says that we are to stir up the gift of God within us. I want to lay my hands on people today that say, I know there's more in me. I've got to find it. I've got to discover it. It may be business. It may be ministry. 
But I will tell you this, if you're at this altar, I want you to consider and ponder on this thing. That God does not desire anyone to just prosper. Not just anyone. There's a specific mandate for who he wants to prosper. Now, you can prosper on your own. You can. You can prosper on your own and still go to hell. And I don't think that's very prosperous at all. But the Bible says he delights in the prosperity of his saints. Your prosperity is not just your money. If you only think that prosperity is your money, you don't understand it at all. Prosperity is the strength and the stability of your spirit. It is the harmony to subdue your flesh and subdue your emotions. That's prosperity. Prosperity is the ability to have your steps ordered by the Lord, that you don't have to second guess the directions you go in. That's prosperity. Now, I want to pray with some people. You ought to already be calling out to God because it's about you and God. But I, when I come and lay my hands, all I'm doing, I'm not coming to speak something over you. If the Lord leads me to do that, I'll do that. But this is about you this morning. This is about you breaking free from every chain and every stronghold in the realm of the spirit. This is about you crying out to God. You making a decision. You're going to do better. You're going to do more for God. There is some, a word that's been spoken to you today that ought to agitate what is on the inside of you, whether it be of God or of Satan.